education reform is, it, is, it, is the term is being used. And it's not the reform that I'm supporting. <laughs> Um, so initially I started at uh, Illinois Eastern, uh, at Mount Carmel, Illinois, and then I made a presentation at the SUA's uh, annual meeting on engaging current employees. We need current employees to be engaged in watching the political activity as well, because you're more likely to be a target. <laughs> than retirees. SUAA annuitants, we have to make sure that definition is understood. Annuitant is anyone that pays into SURS, whether you're a day one, <laughs> if you're a brand new hire, if you're paying into SURS, you are an annuitant. That doesn't mean you're a member of the organization, but it's that's and that's who we are trying to represent. That is, uh, protect pensions, that's outlined in the uh, state constitution, and also funding for higher education. And that is what um, uh, we should all be looking at, because it's important that Illinois maintains a very outstanding uh, higher education system. Now keep in mind, the community colleges are essentially American. This is a unique type of institution in the world. When I did quite a bit of uh, committee work for um, the community college system, England was here. They sent emissaries to find out how community colleges worked, who do they represent, what kind of curriculum they have. China's been here. To do the same thing. <clears throat> I uh, was invited some years ago over to Indianapolis, Indianapolis by some faculty that wanted to know about Illinois Community Colleges. They have Ivy Tech vocational colleges. But not a, not, a not a true broad spectrum community college. They wanted to know how it was working in Illinois. At that time, the governor of Indiana was interested in sort of duplicating the Illinois system. As far as I know, it didn't happen, but there was interest. So um, keep that in mind that uh, <clears throat> uh, you are a valuable resource to all of these communities, and uh, other people throughout the world are taking a look at community colleges as well. Okay. Now, um, my uh, interest in uh, political action, at least with some of the uh, uh, formal part of the introduction. Uh, when I uh, became active in uh, the Newitzen Association, we had no political action committee. No. And so we went through the process much longer than I expected to establish a political action committee. It is known as SUA Action. But it's a registered political action committee with the Department of Elections for the state of Illinois. So it's a separate and distinct organization in regard to funding, in regard to the officers, and et cetera, from SUAA. <clears throat> One of the things that we do is uh, political endorsements. Okay? And then um, when I was president of SUAA, I initiated a legal fund. I wanted to call it the Legal Defense Fund. They said, oh, that's too negative. Well, guess what? That's what we've been doing. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and the biggest success we had with that was uh, our attorney was the primary source of objection to removing that clause in the Constitution that could have eliminated pension benefits or modified it dramatically downward. Because of that success, we lost 2,000 members. Why? Because they thought it was all over with. We won the court case. End of story. No, no, no. It is not the end of the story. It's never dead. <laughs> there are rumblings, not even, no official announcement, rumblings about reopening the Constitution again. Nothing formal 
has come forward. But I was on an endorsement committee uh, with uh, potential candidates asking for support. This is with the IFT. And one of the questions I asked them, are you in favor of opening the Constitution? Yes, no. <laughs> One way or the other. Don't give us a, a lecture. Yes, no. And we're looking for no, a no comment. Keep it simple. Either you are or you aren't. <laughs> and none of them were at that time. Now, one of the reasons uh, that uh, that Constitution didn't get changed because a variety of different groups that would normally not talk to each other, they were afraid if the Constitution were open, their benefit might be limited <laughs> or some component might be affected as well. So you would assume that if this comes up again, there will be this grand coalition, for lack of a better term, to prevent it from occurring. But keep, that's why you should be uh, paying attention to what, what's going on in Springfield, and that's where SUA can help you out if you need some more uh, details. We have uh, Linda Brookhart, Executive Director. We're located physically a, a few steps from the Capitol. When the legislators are in session, she's over there. We have a contract lobbyist, we have also an attorney. He's over there looking at the legal descriptions <laughs> of bills to point out what this really means or doesn't mean. Um, and, and so we're running, uh, comparatively speaking, on a, a skeleton staff in Springfield. And, and to represent approximately 14,000 members right now, or for that matter, anybody else that, uh, uh, you know, asks questions. Uh, uh, so, <clears throat> uh, so far, we've been doing pretty well, but we need to do, uh, in order to mean that staff and the building and et cetera and all the equipment and new computers that goes with it, uh, we can't allow this enrollment to continue to diminish when the threats are still out there. And so uh, we're trying to engage uh, uh, employees, current employees, to understand the time to protect your interests is now. You prevent it. You don't try to restore it once it's gone. <laughs> it's 10 times as difficult than prevent it in the first place. So we want you to help us out and uh, keep track of uh, good leadership here of what is happening or will happen in Springfield. There's an estimate there could be 40 new legislators in the new General Assembly, 40. We don't know exactly where they're coming from, what agendas they may have in their back pocket or wherever they, <laughs> that they're not releasing during their campaign. If they have some ideas, uh, we might hear about them in, in uh, legal form or I mean, uh, legislative form in the near future. So uh, now, the other thing about uh, these bills, what I've given you in this handout, if you need one, uh, there's some around here somewhere. Uh, uh, those are, that's a synopsis, that's, a, that's a, an abbreviation. So the gory details are in the full text of the bill. And that's one of the jobs, is reading the full uh, text of the bill to look at all the time. Okay. Now, <clears throat> unfortunately, higher education is losing public support. As far as uh, Pew Charitable Trust and some other agencies have analyzed public attitude towards higher education, and it's diminishing. And we need to turn that around. Uh, my next effort in this arena will be the common good. What higher education means to the success not only of Illinois but the rest of the U.S. Um, and I, I think I can make an argument for that as well as others have. Uh, that uh, a community, a state, a nation needs higher education and not diminishing what's happened here in Illinois in the last few years, going in the wrong direction, yes. You think that's because of the cost? The cost is a factor, but the state support 
for higher education has been diminishing yep. since 2000, fiscal year 2002. So you have this plot line going down and this plot line tuition. Okay, we've, we've crossed we've crossed the divide. Mm -hmm. Safe support and tuition charges are now <laughs> turned upside down. Well, there. it was meant to be a three-legged stool, as our CFO says frequently. Mm -hmm. and now we're on two legs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Instead so, of that third leg because of them. And that, that's been the trend. And then, of mm -hmm. course, uh, that's... And also, if you consider the... Uh, original pattern, not law, not statute, for community colleges. It's supposed to be a third from the state, a third from local property tax, and a third from tuition. No requirements. That was just an ideal. So if you're a board member, hmm, I run for election. I'm going to increase taxes? No, nah, I don't think so. <laughs> On the state of Illinois, you don't need the money anymore. What was that leave? Tuition. So the student is the one that they're the most vulnerable and the least likely to have any real clout. <laughs> so that's the direction we've been going. That should be stopped, stabilized, etc. Uh, if we can do it. And so, but it will take time and effort and elections to do that. We'll see what happens. Um, so. Um, in regard to these uh, bills, uh, there are ones that I, uh, I picked out primarily to show the negative impact on higher education as I view it, but none of them have passed. None of them have passed. The point is, this is what people are thinking about. Okay. Now, I put the status of those bills, they're either sent back to the House, or they've been sent back to the Senate. That doesn't mean that in the next General Assembly they couldn't be resurfaced. They're only, it's only, delayed. maybe they give up, maybe the, maybe the sponsors give up and decide to go into something else. But if they're still adamant about it, they can reissue these, these so you need to, to watch them. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, I recall uh, 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 they had a, like a student intern working for the uh, Community College Trustees Association. <laughs> it's been some years ago. And he had this stack, literally a stack of bills. And he was going through them one by one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you read the fine print. And uh, our former uh, lobbyist, uh, he's since retired. That's what he did. That's he, he said, I read every detail of every bill that I think might have an impact on the organization I re that I represent. The fine print. Okay. And by the way, the fine print, 3% rule. Are you uh, aware of that? Yes. You are, are you in administration? I'm an HR director. You're trying to keep track of that? <laughs> You're trying to keep track of that? Good luck. <laughs> That means that in a given, and correct me if I'm, in a given uh, salary year, or however you want to describe that, you cannot get an increase above 3% or the college pays a fine, essentially. Mm. Okay, so if let's say you have somebody that uh, teaches a nine-month schedule and uh, decides this summer I'm not going to teach anything, okay, starts back next year, yeah, I'm going to teach the full load in summer. Uh oh, you're about three percent. Either they let him do it, she do it, whomever, or they don't, or they pay the penalty. Well, if you're talking faculty, unless you've got it in their contract, let them. Yeah. Well, it, it could be, for example, for administration, a promotion. Mm-hmm. Okay, wait a minute. We can't give you more than three <laughs> percent. Or we're going to pay the penalty for it. So you have this. Now, there, there's a bipartisan support for pushing it back to 6%. That's not going to help a whole lot, but it'll be better than it is right well, now. The problem is it came out of nowhere. Yeah, uh -huh. it came, exactly. It, came, it, was, it was part of a budget bill at the very end of the session, and boom, it was done. 
and that's where we are right now. That's what you're being governed by. But you know, I've, I've mentioned this to uh, financial officers, and they're just this is, <laughs> does not make their day. <laughs> does not make their day. Really expensive, quickly. Okay. Um, now, <clears throat> a little background on this uh, first sort of a uh, generic uh, concept, higher education centers of excellence. Um, the two um, individuals involved with this is um, in the house, uh, Bill Brady, who's from the Bloomington Normal area. And uh, Illinois State has been doing pretty well on uh, maintaining uh, enrollment. They haven't had a big drop in enrollment. And, uh, and then uh, Chapin Rose, he's lived down in Muhammad. He's just next door, really, to the U of I or Meta Champaign. And they've been doing okay as well. So those institutions in their backyard are not having any major problems. Um, the Centers of Excellence, what, what Chapin wants to do, this is for the uh, public universities right now, primarily. But think about it. It could be everybody. <clears throat> He wants to have each department analyzed in a hierarchical manner. Who are, let's say we have 14 public universities. The first 12 get to keep their programs. The bottom four could be eliminated. Okay, so we won't have an English department at Western Illinois <laughs> or something like that. What does this mean? You know? <clears throat> and uh, then it could be extended to community colleges as well. If, if this works for the public universities, uh, we'll just go after the 48 community colleges and see what we can do. Uh, the idea of closing doors is not new. Even with the last uh, two years with no budget, there was a time when they were looking at some of the small community colleges in the deep part of the south, uh, southern part of the state. Well. Geographically, if you close this community college over here, you have to commute maybe 100 miles to another one. So they're not, chances are uh, commuting is going to be, I just won't do it. That hasn't happened, but that, that, was, that was talked about. Uh, there's a former uh, representative uh, from Elgin that wanted to close Western. Who wants to go to Macomb anyway? I mean, <laughs> He had no, I didn't care about that part of the state. It's not in my background, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, uh, I don't know what kind of analysis they would do on a given program that would make sense across the board. In fact, it doesn't make sense at all, but nevertheless, this is on the table. Um, if a, a student has a, a B or better average from a high school, automatically admitted to a public university. The U of I? Ooh, they wouldn't like that. I know they didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, wow. again, for community colleges, open admission, not quite, because you have program requirements. It's not just walk in the door. So, like a nursing program has program requirements, etc. And the other might have prerequisites or something uh, similar. Um, so I don't think this is what uh, at least the academic circle is interested in having this. Uh, nor, in my personally, I think that's. And, oh, and by the way, if you didn't get admitted to a public university, it will shuffle you over to the community college. You have good students here. They're, they're here for a reason. They like the institution. They like the environment. They uh, want to cut costs by living at home or whatever it may be. There are all kinds of reasons that they shouldn't be funneled into slots. Uh, so, um, And then uh, the, uh, the other thing is that the Illinois Board of Higher Education uh, wants, it wants it converted to a, uh, from a coordinating board to a governing board. Now, a, quarter, uh, a coordinating board is, to some degree, like herding cats, you know. <laughs> but you want to try to get the institutions to have some similarity in how they function. I mean, it's understandable. 
But a, um, a governing board said, you will do this, or else. <laughs> and that's, that's, to me, that's too much power in that type of board. And it's also, uh, he, uh, Rose wants to get rid of all of the other public university boards. Eliminated. Everything from the public universities would be done by the Illinois Board of Higher Education. Mm. Yeah, that they would combine those two. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then um, I would guesstimate that if they could, they'd get rid of community college boards as well. And just have one mega board that would make all the decisions. Each community is different. So yes, I don't see how that could well, possibly work. Well, community college is very different from a four-year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's been out there for at least a year now, combining those boards. Mm -hmm. Dr. Valdez has mm -hmm. talked about it. Well, I, I served on the Board of Trustees for Easton. And the uh, Eastern Illinois environment, et cetera, and issues are not the same as Governor State mm -hmm. in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And so there are individual aspects of these various universities that, that they know about and the board should be informed about and that's how they tend to function. Uh, the, the Tribune, Chicago Tribune, came out with the idea to get rid of all of these boards. Hmm. Yeah, including community college boards. And just put everything, because they would know what's going on. That's you know, <laughs> why. I served on the faculty advisory committee to the Board of Higher Education some years ago. And we could not, as an advisory board, generate an agenda. We couldn't bring up an issue that wasn't already on their agenda. We only responded to whatever they decided to put on the agenda. So. <laughs> Uh, one of the things, and some of you may recall this, uh, there was an organization that tried to get rid of community college two-degree nursing programs. Okay. That wasn't on their agenda. And I was trying to get them to consider opposing that. They wouldn't talk about it. It's not on our agenda. We're not listening to you. So advisory, not really. It's more symbolic than anything else. So um, I'm strongly opposed to that arrangement for public care education in Illinois. Um, <coughs> Fellow William Halbrook from Shelbyville, Illinois, um, decided that uh, there should be removed non-essential expenses from the budget, <clears throat> which would include um, uh, advertisement. You can advertise your college, you can advertise your program, you can have a pencil with your school's name on it, <laughs> anything of that nature. And um, where I live, uh, I'm very close to Scott Air Force Base. And there are a lot of um, <coughs> personnel uh, that work there that are interested in pursuing a degree. We get a lot of students from Scott Air Force Base. Outside the main gate, there are billboards or University of Missouri in St. Louis, uh, Indiana State University, <laughs> on down the line. Under this bill, uh, our college couldn't advertise, you know, drive five miles if you're on campus. Uh, so that that seems to be uh, really the wrong way to go. You may, you, you may want to be advertising uh, to <clears throat> indicate to students and to parents what's available and so on and so forth. That apparently occurred at uh, Eastern. They had been uh, seeing a, a significant enrollment drop, and it's uh, a semi-rural environment. Uh, yeah. And so um, when I was on the board, I talked to the admission director and got really nowhere with her. She wasn't interested. <laughs> Uh, they, they really were not exploiting the Metro East at all, the second largest metropolitan area in the state. They had no presence whatsoever. Mm -hmm. O'Fallon well, High School uh, had uh, they did a survey of where students were considering attending college. 
B string was zero. Not even one. <laughs> so they had no interest or experience or understanding of that particular institution actually existed. And that wasn't always the case. Right now, they lead the state in enrollment increase. 7.5% more increase than U of I or Illinois State. So they, they hired a consultant, apparently knew what to do, <laughs> which does involve advertising. I'll be at Eastern this weekend. I'm going to ask some more detailed questions about the, how this turnaround. But <clears throat> Western, in many ways, equivalent, but location, size, et cetera, their enrollment didn't increase. So something really definitely <laughs> happened. And uh, are you aware who ranks first in the nation in community college bachelor degree completions? First in the nation? Illinois. We should be advertising that <laughs> yeah. to decision makers as to where you want to start your journey if you're going to follow a bachelor's degree. That's a, that's a big item, I think. But it has to be out there so <laughs> the, the public is aware of it. Some of you had a neighbor that way. He didn't even know the course is transferred. I should start my kids at a two-year college? Well, why, why would they do that? They want a, they want a four-year degree. I said, well, they, they can transfer courses. Find out where they're going. Take a look at it. He didn't know. We assume everybody knows something. They don't. <laughs> so... Uh, I mean, I think we should be in the advertising business. We've got a great item to sell. Guess who's been here to check out the community college system? England. They have no comparison in England, community colleges. China is one. They have no comparison to community colleges. Very few places. This is essentially a unique type of institution in the world of higher education. So, somebody else is interested. <laughs> okay. Um, prohibition of non-essential uh, expenses include travel. No seminars for you. <laughs> That's probably no, faculty no faculty development. Uh, all kinds of, at every level, uh, you know, updating on equipment for maintenance. And you need to know about this new heating and air conditioning system. Is how it works, or something, you know. Well, if you want to do that, you pay it out of your own pocket. Well, what's what, what's that going to accomplish? So, so is that saying they don't want you can't use your state money for any of this stuff? Well, yeah, but you're, they're getting the colleges are getting state money, so <laughs> sometimes sometimes they're getting some. But, it's not, oh. but I mean, our own our tuition money and stuff we can use for these. Well, things. I, I, <clears throat> that's a good question. You have to look at. Uh, what actually is allowable expense, but something we're looking into. Because into. we're building our budgets. Yeah. Now, Arizona, for example, expecting money. no state money. Hmm. Zero. Okay? But we only rank two ranks above that in per pupil expenditure from the state. We're above Louisiana and Arizona. It's easy to beat Arizona because they don't have any, they don't spend any money. But we're just above Louisiana. Everybody else is ahead of us for people expenditure. Hmm. You know, our board has directed us. It's not supposed to be part of our budget because we can't rely on it. On travel? No, on state money. Oh, on state yeah. money, yeah. Well, I, I agree. So, well, anyway, um, Vocational Academy uh, Opportunity Act. Uh, this is a... Uh, Fire Petty uh, from Chicago. He wants to build uh, major vacational schools in East St. Louis in Chicago. When some schools are having problem keeping <laughs> uh, running as they currently exist, and he wants two new institutions. I'm thinking, you know, uh, we're probably a 25 minute commute for students in East St. Louis. We have all kinds of vocational programs. No shortage of vocational programs in Chicago either. So what is, where is he going to get the money for this? I have no idea. Fortunately, that was killed. So it's, um, it's going nowhere. 
for the three-year teaching degree. This is from a fellow named Cavaletto from he's from Centralia. And he wants to take the requirements for a teaching certification down to three years only. Not four, three. And three years with no additional courses, you would get a bachelor's degree. Okay, and his argument is uh, we're having a hard time uh, finding uh, finding teachers for K-12 in his neck of the woods. Well, he's not the only one, but reducing the certification to three years, I don't think is the right way to go about it. Um, and so <clears throat> that particular bill is b uh, back in the um, Senate assignments. I will give Cavallaro uh, some uh, an applause uh, some years ago. Uh, again, this one I was on the board of Eastern. Uh, <clears throat> I went up to Springfield with the president before the uh, uh, <clears throat> appropriations hearing, where you're presenting a budget <clears throat> uh, to, to see if you sway them to <laughs> support your institution. And there's quite a hierarchy on this appropriations hearing. Uh, they have a, a committee uh, of legislators, and then the first to go to uh, testify is U of I. They fill the room with all U of I supporters. Everybody else waits out in the hall until they're finished. <clears throat> 